Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Evolutionism itself is really a form of insanity. Really? Well, I guess I better hurry up before the men in white coats turn up. What have you got for me? This is candy. Aww. Oh. This is candy. This creature here is, is something I want you to think about. This is a pretty amazing creature. I'll say one thing, Vanef's arguments. They are pretty original. Although I have heard something rather similar before. Behold, the atheist's nightmare. The next statement I think we can see coming a mile off. How would evolution create a creature like this? The answer, of course, is very simple. It didn't! Just like Comfort's banana, the domesticated cat is a product of selective breeding, and therefore is potentially unsuitable when discussing evolutionary traits. Since in a minute we'll be discussing fur length, mankind has had a profound effect in controlling the length of cat fur, producing breeds with varying lengths of fur, and indeed those with no hair at all. But I think it's fair to assume for the rest of the video that the same arguments apply to wild cats. Oh, look, he's got little tufts on top of his ears. Now, Candy here has hair, stay Candy, that cover her entire body. right? And the hairs on her body, depending on where they are, whether they're these little hairs around her mouth, her nose, these hairs, and these hairs here on top of her head, and all over her body, the hairs all over her body have thousands of different lengths. Thousands of different lengths. Considering each hair probably has a unique length, that's well short of the mark. But then this is coming from a man who estimated the number of words in the English language at 40,000, and that the average flood deposits less than one quark's worth of sediment. It's a single atom of jumbonium, an element so rare, the nucleus alone is worth more than $50,000. How much more? A hundred thousand. Now, when she loses hair, when she sheds, a new hair takes its place, and that hair grows to exactly the right length. Exactly? Not one millimeter more, not one millimeter less. Goodness, that is precise. And the moral of the story? That's design. This, to me, represents the archetypal intelligent design argument. Namely, if I can't think of any mechanism by which it happens, it must have been designed. There's also absolutely no experimental evidence to back it up let alone support the idea that it is down to an intelligent creator. Science writer Michael Shermer explained it very well. And part of that, the same theme, is expressed nicely here in the Sidney Harris cartoon. For those of you in the back, it says here, then a miracle occurs. I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. This single slide completely dismantles the intelligent design arguments. There's nothing more to it than that. You can say a miracle occurs, it's just that it doesn't explain anything, it doesn't offer anything, there's nothing to test. It's the end of the conversation for intelligent design uh, creationists, whereas, and, and it's true, scientists sometimes throw terms out as linguistic place fillers, dark energy or dark matter or something like that, until we figure out what it is, we'll just call it this. It's the beginning of the causal chain for science, for intelligent design creationists, it's the end of the chain. And the really sneaky detail is that it's quite difficult to check this claim. After all, it's quite difficult to keep track of an individual hair follicle, certainly over the lifetime of an individual, and measure the length of every single hair that comes out of that follicle. But I'd bet my bottom dollar that if you were to try it, what you would discover is that the hair shows a normal distribution, i.e. the lengths are clustered around a mean, and the mean and spread of the data would vary from one location on the cat to the other. We're certainly a long way from the idea of each hair being a perfect match to the one that went before, down to the individual millimeter. But how does Neff explain this consistency? Somehow. Her body knows to grow hairs in different locations around all across her body, thousands of various different lengths, to create this beautifully coiffed, groomed looking creature with thousands of different hair lengths in thousands of different little locations around her body. Exactly the right length, they grow to just the right length, and then stop. So he doesn't offer an explanation other than somehow. I thought I'd have a go. The reason why I chose this topic is because I'm a plant scientist. I wanted to test how easy it is to research a subject that I've never studied before using only a basic knowledge of biology and the information resource that is the internet. Five minutes on Google turned up this. This paper outlines mankind's current understanding of hair follicle cycling, although it should be noted that this knowledge is still incomplete, mainly because it's a mixture of biochemistry and tissue structure which is quite difficult to tease apart. I'll post a link to the full paper, but here I'll provide a very basic summary. 
The phases of hair growth and death are controlled by hormonal interactions. The hormones at each step of the cycle act to promote the formation of the hormones of the next step and inhibit those of the last. Thus, the cycle self-perpetuates. By lengthening or shortening the growth phase relative to the other two, the average length of the hairs from that follicle are increased or decreased respectively. The paper proposes with evidence that hormones released from nerve endings under the skin are what help to alter this length of growth phase, and conditions such as hypothyroidism, which affects one of my own dogs, suggest that the length of hair is controlled by thyroid hormones, and thus varies depending upon the architecture and blood supply underlying the skin. If it weren't so, then she would have hairs on her face that were as long as those on her tail or on her behind or on her back. And she wouldn't look anything like a house cat. She wouldn't be nearly so beautiful. So all that remains now is to come up with an evolutionary explanation as to why hair length varies from one location on an animal to another. Well, you don't have to be a genius to realize that animals with short hair run the risk of suffering extreme cold in the winters, while those with long hair run the risk of overheating in the summers. And some parts of the animal need warming more than others. Long hair on the face poses the problem of impairing vision or sense of smell. Long hair on the feet increases the risk of matting hair, which could make walking painful. And hair needs to be kept short on the belly so that teats can be exposed for suckling young and for hygiene reasons. So you see how easy it is to research and propose a plausible explanation without invoking the supernatural. But I've just got one question in response. Human head hair seems to be unlimited in its length, so does that mean it's not intelligently designed? There's no way that nature could, could create a, cause a creature to have hairs of thousands of different precise lengths all over its body from on its nose, on its cheek, on its uh, above its head Above its head? Are you sure? Well, it might explain where some of yours has gone, Neff. It's uh, on its on its back, around its between its paws What? How much of your cat's fur is actually attached to its body? On its paws, on the top of its arms Its arms? Neff, have you actually ever looked at a cat? They don't have arms Oh, well, maybe he just misspoke. I doubt he'll say it again. Under its arms, under its stomach, on its tail, around the back of its legs, and all these different thousands of different hair lengths, and for every one of these hairs to just happen to grow to the exact right length, no less, no more. That's really a form of insanity. Bing, bong, bing, 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 bong, bing, 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 b